great. All right, go ahead. All right, uh, thanks for the introduction. So hi everyone, thanks for having me. Uh, so uh, I'm Zach Lame, I'm a postdoc at Princeton University and uh, NOAA's Geophysical Fluid Dynamics Laboratory. And uh, just a quick little intro about me. My background is very much meteorology and climate science, and I'm very new to machine learning, so I expect many of you are much more experts on this topic. And I guess I got interested in machine learning with my last postdoc, which was at Colorado State University with Elizabeth Barnes. And I was really interested, um, I guess my research, I'm interested in a lot of things for climate science. And one of the things I'm really interested in broadly is trying to disentangle climate change from climate variability. And you know, we have many methods already in climate science to do these types of techniques, but you know, there's been so much growing interest in using machine learning. And I thought, you know, for my postdoc after my PhD, why not try something a little different and try out some of these new techniques in machine learning? And I was also hesitant about this idea that machine learning, you know, algorithms are essentially black boxes. But what's so cool, I think, is there's now these techniques that have been developed by image processing and computer science that really leverage these explainability methods. And what we found is I think this is a really good example of like having fun in science and really seeing your research. And I think the common thread for my talk is going to be don't be afraid to ask really silly questions in research because you might learn something interesting out of them. Um, so I'll just get started with sort of how I think about machine learning. And I guess when I think about applications in machine learning for weather and climate, I really think that it sort of falls into three types of categories of different things people work on. One of them is being sort of uh, parameterizing our climate models and sort of working on the emulator space. And then there's another one trying to just speed up everything. Of course, as we continue to advance and make our climate models and their weather models more complex, we're going to run into issues with computational expenses. So there's a whole field that's trying to, you know, use machine learning to, to speed everything up. But uh, to be honest, I really don't know much about those two categories. And what I'm really interested in is this last part. And can we really learn something new? And, and the way I approach it is, can we learn something new about the climate system? Getting at this crux of my research, which is all about disentangling climate change versus climate variability. And of course, just to, you know, add on more motivation for why we should use machine learning. Of course, as many of you all know, we have just a growing amount of data. You know, we're at a point where there is just, is, I don't want to say too much data, but in, in a sense, there's too much data and not enough people to analyze it all. And what something machine learning is really good about is using, you know, finding patterns in data. So we can really leverage all of these types of data archives that we have in atmospheric sciences and use these types of techniques um, to hopefully learn something new. And I really like this quote from a BAMS article from a few years ago that really just motivates that even if, you know, your research is more often doing field work, you know, if you're up in Antarctica, uh, all of us at some point are going to be sort of using computer code, you know, programming in some way or another, and probably in the next couple of years coming across machine learning like algorithms in our research for statistics. In fact, many of you probably already use machine learning and you might not even realize it. And just to, to encapsulate, you know, machine learning for our field, I it's certainly I want to make sure I mention it's it's certainly not new, even though it's this buzzword that's ongoing right now. Machine learning, particularly for meteorology, actually goes back decades. And there's been a lot of really interesting work in the last couple of years really now using these new techniques, specifically like explainability methods to really look at things like identifying thunderstorms or using it for satellite images, like using our new GOES satellite network to really extract really interesting patterns um, using classification type schemes. What one area is that I think machine learning has been around for decades in fields like meteorology. I actually think it's a bit newer sort of in the traditional climate science space. So really in this 
area of climate change versus climate variability and how can we use these types of statistical methods for sort of thinking sort of rethinking about like modes of climate variability we probably all have taken empirical orthogonal functions eofs of different climate patterns and used that for years but how can we sort of also look at perhaps some other types of techniques to think about climate variability and i think this is a really exciting growing space of course, I guess I'm biased in that. And then lastly, you know, machine learning is also becoming increasingly popular sort of in the field of oceanography. And there's been some great work in the last few years thinking about all sorts of different applications um, in oceanography, anything ranging from things like ocean acidification or thinking about things like the AMOC. Um, there's been really exciting work being done using explainability methods to learn new ocean dynamics. And I, I re realize I don't really have an introduction in this talk sort of on what, you know, machine learning is besides this overly simple schematic, which is all, like how I think of machine learning. It, what I really think of it is, is any statistical algorithm, you know, any statistical technique where you take lots of data and you're trying to make a prediction or you're trying to extract patterns. And again, there's been a lot of hesitation on using some of these methods. One of them, which we've already mentioned multiple times, being that it's a black box. How in the world did this machine learning method, how did it make its prediction, which hopefully is accurate, um, but also just sort of concerns about reproducibility uh, for machine learning methods or reliability for machine learning methods. What are some biases that could exist in your data? that we might not know are there, and certainly because of this sort of concern about it being black box, how can we figure out what's really going on? And I hope that this work will sort of give some inspiration on how we can use some of these explainability methods for even really simple applications to learn new science. And like I said, that all of this work I've been doing in the last couple of years has really been just fun. It's just really throwing crazy questions on a piece of paper and seeing if we can maybe do something interesting with machine learning. So like I said, we're going to start off really simple and I want you to picture just a map of temperature. And imagine you sort of have your your data file for that map of temperature, like a net CDF file. And along with that data file, we, it comes along with some metadata. So it gives us information like how many latitude and longitude points there are. It lets us know, you know, what produced the data, you know, whether it was a climate model, whether it was from something like satellite observations. And it also tells us what time period, you know, that map, that gridded map is coming from. But what if I were to say you don't have that temporal information for some reason in this metadata of your net CDF file? Would you be able to know if I gave you a random map of temperature from a climate model output what year it is just based on looking at that map given no other information? And you might say, well, of, of course, something like that would never happen in reality. But we decided to ask this question to a neural network and see if it would be able to learn patterns in the climate system to be able to know what year that map is. And, uh, you know, sort of I'll just give you the takeaway. What we found is that interestingly enough, we found that the neural network is really using patterns of forced climate change all around the world and it's spatially leveraging them to figure out what year it is. There's another question that we've also asked for other work and that is where did it come from? So basically what is the data set that that map is coming from? And if you're interested in that, that we published that work a few months ago and I, I'm not going to be talking about that work today. And for this question about what year it is, you know, this really simple, silly question, we've actually used it for many different applications so far. We've used it for thinking about different climate variables, so not just temperature, but what about patterns of precipitation or extreme precipitation? And how does the neural network learn these patterns around the map in order to know what year it is? Um, we've used it for things like timing of emergence of variables. So when do we see the climate change forced response come out from internal variability? And then I've used it for things like uh, attributions. So thinking about things like aerosols and greenhouse gases, and that's sort of going to be the focus of the work I'll talk about today. 
So just to give some background, so we're sort of all on the same page for a climate model simulations, I want you to return to that sort of image of a map of temperature, and I want you to think about what is sort of the global mean surface temperature of that map. So if we have something like that for observations, we have a 20th century reanalysis that can go back until like 1900, and we can sort of plot a global mean surface temperature. So that's what you're seeing here by the white dashed line. Um, so you can see that there's some year to year variability, but of course in the last, especially last 20, 30 years, you can see that's the upward trend due to climate change. So what if we were to try to sort of reproduce this, but using a climate model? So now what I've done is I've taken a climate model simulation and I've plotted the global mean surface temperature from 1920 all the way to the end of the 21st century. You'll notice that it sort of nicely captures the overall upward trend, but it does not get that year to year variability. And that's, that's okay. Um, we expect or hope that our climate model is sort of able from the boundary conditions to extract sort of the force response, things like the response to climate change, but due to sort of the chaos in the atmosphere, the internal variability, we would not expect to be a direct match for observations. So what now we've learned what we can do is that we can run the climate model just by tweaking the initial conditions ever so slightly. We can run it again and again and again and essentially get a range of what the internal variability is in the climate system. So now you can see that I've run this climate model multiple times and we call these large ensembles. So you can see each thin little line is a different different ensemble member capturing that same long term trend but sort of the range of variability in the climate system. So what you can do is then you can sort of average out that noise in the climate system, and that's what you get from the red line. And we call that the forced response. So that's, you can think of that as climate change. And then anything sort of encompassed by sort of the spread of the thin blue lines, that's the range of internal variability in the climate system. So you can see just as a proof of concept, sort of if we removed um, the sort of the red line from that previous, then we sort of just get a flat line, just the noise. And that's essentially what this climate model would look like without an external forcing, without climate change. And essentially we consider that in climate science being anomalies, that's the word we use. So, you know, what goes into sort of this climate model simulation is just, it's not just how we think of sort of greenhouse gas climate change. There's lots of other things going on in the Earth system that are sort of affecting this sort of forced response. And that can be things like changes in aerosols, both coming from industry or things like biomass burning, like wildfires. And importantly, also, there, this climate model also includes things like changes to the land surface, which really has important implications for understanding Earth's temperature. Um, but what's really difficult is sort of being able to extract all of these different components and thinking about internal variability. So what we've learned in recent years is that you can conduct, you can- individuals, communities, organizations, and government in the management of carbon emissions. Sorry, was there a question? I didn't catch that. No, that was something else actually, it wasn't our end. I think that was someone online. Okay. <laughs> Uh, so what we've learned is what you can do is sort of conduct these types of large ensembles, but you can do them where you only focus on certain forcings. So you can only focus on things like greenhouse gases or only focus on aerosols. And these are essentially called single forcing large ensembles. So what we're going to be doing is we're going to be using the Community Earth System Model 1 large ensemble. And they've run at NCAR a series of other of these single forcing simulations where one of these simulations is they essentially fix greenhouse gases at the very beginning at 1920 levels and let the aerosols evolve through time. Then they conduct a parallel situation where they sort of fix the aerosols and allow things like carbon dioxide and methane to evolve through time. We can then compare that to a simulation where all the forces are changing. You can think of that being as, quote, the most realistic as the real world. And then, of course, we can compare that with observations. And again, getting at the so what factor of all of this is, is that we know greenhouse gases cause warming in the long term. 
But the climate response to aerosols is a lot more complicated. In some cases, it can have a warming effect or a cooling effect. So really trying to understand changes, you know, regional climate variability and understand is it being affected by natural variability? Is it being affected by greenhouse gases or aerosols? You know, looking at these types of simulations can be really useful for extracting all of the components. So now that I've introduced sort of the simulation, let's get into the machine learning part of it. So we'll return to that map of temperature. It's going to go into a simple artificial neural network. Um, for all of these applications, to be honest, that we found so far for what we're doing in climate, we found that actually really simple neural networks provide the best skill. And adding more complexity has actually sort of degraded the skill. So that's just been uh, sort of a side interesting finding we've had so far. So each point on this temperature map is going to go into this input layer. And it's going to go into these hidden layers, so that's where all this sort of nonlinear magic happens. And if you're not familiar with neural networks, you can basically, basically it's very similar to regression and just sort of having a nonlinear mapping to it. Um, so, you know, each of these points are going into this neural network. And then what is the prediction? And we're again, we're trying to predict what year that map is. Of course, that prediction itself is super silly. So what the really cool part about this is, is that we can use explainability methods to figure out how did the neural network learn that it was coming from that particular year. And what this method that we're going to be using for a lot of our work is called, and it's called layer-wise relevance propagation. And basically what it does is it produces a heat map for every input to the neural network, where brighter colors tell you that that area was more important for the neural network's prediction. So let me show some examples that are sort of outside the climate space. Let's imagine you have a classification neural network and you input, you know, this is a picture of a wolf. The neural network correctly classifies that it's a wolf. Then you can use this explainability method and layer-wise relevance propagation to look at where on that image was the most important location for the neural network to look, learn that it was a wolf. So you can see it's kind of pointing to its nose, it's pointing to its, its ears. Here's another example. You can see the image of the volcano. And again, the brighter colors are the areas that are sort of more relevant for the prediction, which is sort of outlining sort of the cone of the volcano. And then lastly, as an example, here's an image of a shark. So you can see sort of where on the image in the right hand column, where did the neural network really look at to know that it was a shark? But I want to point out that this method of layer-wise relevance propagation, it doesn't mean that the prediction was correct. So this sort of this method, this heat map is produced, as I said, for every single input, whether it's right or wrong. So what you can actually do in many cases for this method is you can sometimes use this explainability method to look at, OK, when it was correct, it looked here but when it was wrong, it looked here. And there's lots of different ways you can sort of extract uh, the explainability method to sort of get at this right and wrong decision. You can also look at areas that, quote, positively contributed to the prediction. And then in some cases, you can look at negative areas. And what that means is where were regions on the image that sort of made the neural network try to predict something wrong or something different. Um, so anyway, that's sort of why I think these explainability methods are so exciting is because you can ask many different science questions. But importantly, they're not perfect. So this is sort of a form of post hoc feature attribution. And there's many of these different types of explainability methods. And you can just sort of compare across this row here for an input of a bird and then using different explainability methods where did it think the neural network looked and as you can see there you know there's a general agreement but there are differences between the methods and i really think you know as we continue to use these types of methods that it's going to be more and more important to not only use one method in our studies but compare across multiple methods and then there's a whole field called interpretable machine learning, um, and I, I won't get into that. So what I'm trying to say really is that there are so many methods being developed almost every day in the field of computer science, and I think a lot of them are applicable for the us that work sort of in, in the geosciences space. 
And I just want to give one more example uh, using climate science as the example for how this explainability method might work using something we know lots about, and that's sort of the El Nino Southern Oscillation. And I want you to imagine we have a neural network here where we have maps of sea surface temperatures. And essentially we create a simple binary classification neural network. And all we want to do is ask the neural network to tell us from that global map of sea surface temperatures, whether it was an El Nino or La Nina. And that's all we're asking. So then we can use sort of the explainability method to figure out, okay, so the neural network is telling me it's an El Nino or La Nina, but did it learn that for a physical based reason or is it just some statistical construct? So what you're seeing here in the top map is that heat map from the explainability method. And it's really outlining, as you can see, sort of the conical El Nino Southern Oscillation pattern where sea surface temperatures that extend off in the equatorial Pacific. So this gives us some confidence that our you know, neural network is learning something for physical based reasons. And again, that's another advantage for explainability methods. But let me return to sort of the problem I'm discussing first. And, and again, just to overview, uh, we have this map of temperature from these climate model simulations that have different combinations of aerosols and greenhouse gases. And we just want to ask the neural network what year it is and then use this explainability method to figure out how it knows. So what does our data look like uh, from the climate model? This is just looking at trends from the raw data. So the first simulation I've outlined here is where greenhouse gases are held constant. So in that type of world, you're only having aerosols evolve. So you can see that there's actually a cooling response due to aerosols going through the 20th century. We can then compare that to the parallel situation where aerosols don't change. However, greenhouse gases evolve through the 20th and 21st century. Now you can see we have a warming sort of across the planet. And then we can compare that to sort of the quote most realistic climate model simulation where they both evolve and you can see it, it's sort of a it's not a complete average of the two maps but it's sort of a muted warming response due to the effect of aerosols and now you can compare them across here so what does the predictions from the neural network what do they look like again we're predicting the years so the x-axis and y-axis are the years this is for the three different simulations and the perfect prediction would be sort of the the one to one line in white. The predictions from the climate models are sort of in blue shading here. So you might say, OK, well, it seems that the neural network is is making pretty good predictions. It sort of parallels the one to one line. What would happen if all of a sudden we take an out of sample data set and we input observations into this? So that's what I've added here with the red dots. So again, the model, the neural network has trained and tested on the climate model data. And now all of a sudden I'm giving it observations, maps from the real world. So you can see on the left hand side, those red dots clearly don't follow the run to one red line. They're all over the place. And, and that makes sense because our real world, of course, has greenhouse gases evolving. Now the middle one is interesting because that's the world where there's no aerosols, or at least that's what the neural network learns. Um, but we know in the real world, of course, aerosols are super important for the climate system. And what you might see by the red dots is they actually parallel the one-to-one -one line pretty well. You'll notice that there's an, sort of an offset from sort of the, the blue shading in the, the actual one-to-one -one line that's sort of in common with the middle one and the right one. And this is essentially just due to sort of differences in the mean state of the climate model and observations. So what we really care about here is the slope of the lines. In other words, is the neural network able to learn time evolving patterns and able to know the year? So our sort of metric here is capturing sort of this, this one to one slope. So what's interesting then is looking on the right hand side. So the all simulation is that climate model that's supposedly more the most realistic because it has greenhouse gases and observations. But you can see the actual slope of that sort of red dots when we test observations. Yeah, is not... Sorry. No, again, sorry. it was someone online. I don't know who it was. OK, yeah, that's OK. I, did. I said not about it. I was muting. You keep going. Um, 
No problem. Um, so you can see that it's sort of the best predictions for observations is the middle one. So what does that really, what is that telling us? What's the neural network learning? We can then see, okay, you know, was this result robust? So for machine learning, one thing, you know, I like to do, and to be honest, I was very surprised when I first started machine learning, how sort of sensitive the results are to even things like your, your random seeds. So what we like to do is because we have tons of data with these large ensembles to play with, you can run many, many different neural networks by changing which ensemble members you use for training and testing. You can create these nice histograms of the predictions. And, and so what we basically see here, and still after you know looking at all these different neural networks, is that the predictions for the observations for the one where we hold aerosols constant, the GHD, consistently is closest to the one-to-one -one line for observations, even after all of these different neural networks. So now we can turn to the explainability method to figure out, you know, how did it make this prediction and why is it doing better on this simulation that, you know, is, is the idealized one compared to the realistic one. So like I said, for every input that you give to the neural network using layer-wise relevance propagation, you receive one of these heat maps. Um, so what you can do is lots of different things. So you, like in traditional climate science st statistics, you can take composites of the explainability maps and average them over time. Um, and so you can, you know, that's what I'm sort of doing here is taking averages of those heat maps for different sort of epoch periods and I'll just scan quickly through here and be just, just showing an example, one of the things you can do. So then you can see sort of what patterns over time, what brighter colors, higher relevance regions did the neural network look at. So to sort, I know that was a lot of maps, so to sort of zoom in on these three different simulations, again, still the, the one where we sort of fix greenhouse gases is on the left, the fixed aerosols is in the middle, and then the supposedly realistic one is on the right. So what really are some interesting differences here is this is again another explainability map where brighter colors are more important regions. And you might notice that the, the North Atlantic clearly is popping out as being a really important region for it being able to know what year it is. And this makes sense knowing, thinking back to climate science is that while a lot of the area is warming due to greenhouse gases, the, the North Atlantic is kind of doing its own thing. Uh, so it, the neural network is clearly using that pattern as being an important region. You'll also notice that Southeast Asia pops out in the, the simulations where there are aerosols evolving. So this is all giving us confidence that the neural network is using physically based things in the climate system to make its predictions. But you'll notice for the one again, for the observations where it does better, where aerosols again in this one are fixed, so you can see if you look at Southeast Asia, it doesn't light up um, because we don't see this sort of time evolution of aerosols, but that the North Atlantic is super important for this simulation. So what we can do is we can kind of create little histograms of all those neural networks again of the relevance regions and sort of compare uh, across the different simulations. And as you have saw from the previous map, all three climate model simulations highlighted the North Atlantic, but the one for the, the greenhouse gases clearly highlighted that be, the North Atlantic being the most important region. So what this is essentially telling us is that perhaps that the pattern of forced change in the North Atlantic for this climate model simulation is more in common with observations. And then you, we can compare this for many different regions, and this is sort of just show, showing an example of some of the fun things you can do with explainability methods. Okay, so I'm going to kind of switch gears a little bit into another sort of fun example of some recent work we've done. And just to get started, uh, so instead of thinking sort of at the surface, now I want you to think about vertically aloft. So when we think about climate model projections of the future of temperature, but now through the troposphere and stratosphere, this is what the projections sort of look like. This is sort of the ensemble mean from uh, the CSM1 large ensemble for the end of the 21st century. So how to read this map is that the y-axis is vertical from the troposphere into the stratosphere. 
the x-axis is latitude. So on the left is the Antarctic and on the right is the Arctic. So you'll see some features that we know from, you know, our earliest climate model simulations where we see stratospheric cooling. We see things like Arctic amplification. And we also see this sort of warming in the upper tropical troposphere. Now, there's been tons of work trying to understand this, you know, the causes of this sort of tropical tropospheric warming. But one of the issues that has arisen is that there's sort of been a disconnect between the observed trend of this warming in the upper tropical troposphere versus what we see in observations. So this is sort of now what you're looking at is a map is a visual of the trends of temperature again same you know you're looking vertically from the troposphere into the stratosphere but this is from reanalysis data over the last 40 years so you can see stratosphere cooling you can see arctic amplification you can see maybe a sign of tropical troposphere warming but if you compare across other data sets it might not be so evident so one of the issues that has arisen um, in areas of climate science has been trying to understand why do climate models show more warming in the historical record than we observe in observations. So what you're looking at here on the left hand side is sort of a histogram of trends from sort of CMIP5 models, the gray bars, versus a variety of observational data sets. And as you can see, sort of the observed trend from satellite observations of this sort of tropical tropospheric warming has been lower than what climate models are predicting. And there's been tons of work trying to figure out, you know, how can we explain this difference? What is the cause of this disconnect? Is it something in the climate system? Is it something that there is wrong with the models? Um, so it, it's there's just been a lot of work to sort of address this question. So some recent work led by Steve Pachedli of Lawrence Livermore National Lab uh, got together with a group of us and we tried to think about how can we use sort of machine learning to address this problem. Again, thinking of it by asking a really simple question. And we're going to take advantage of all of these large ensembles of climate models that have been recently developed. And what we're going to do is we're going to try to use machine learning methods to predict what's the internal component to recent trends in the tropical troposphere. So that's again due to internal climate variability, you know, the noise in the climate system, and then also predict what's the externally forced component to the trend in the tropical troposphere. So due to climate change. So what we can do is we can input sort of maps of things like surface temperature or a sea surface temperature. And then again, we're trying to here predict these two internal and external components. And we start off using uh, a variety of machine learning methods, but we're using here to start climate model simulations. Again, because we have all these ensembles, we know the true internal and external components. So here's sort of just sort of what all the results look like. Uh, so how to read this on the left hand side is sort of the predictions for the unforced trends. So that's due to the internal climate variability. And this is for the climate model simulations, which is all the different colors. So a perfect prediction here is sort of, again, fitting the one to one line. And then on the right hand side, that's your sort of climate change driven trend that it's also making a prediction. Um, we did some sort of cross sort of model validation here where you rotate models and observations. So that's what you're seeing by the individual dots. And then what you can do is when we can see that, OK, you know, using a variety of machine learning methods, we see that it's doing pretty well learning sort of the internal and external components. We can then again input an out of sample data set like observations and then try to predict what is the internal contribution to the recent tropical sphere troposphere trend versus sort of the the climate change external contribution and then like everything else we can use different types of explainability methods even simple methods can be classified as explainability by just sort of looking at patterns of the regression weights and you can look at that again for this sort of the two predictors which are the sort of internal component and external component and we can see that things like patterns of climate variability that we know is climate science pops out as being really important for the sort of the machine learning algorithms to make their predictions things like the interdecadal pacific oscillation or or the atlantic multi-decadal oscillation these are all really important 
features in the climate system um, so that we can see that essentially these algorithms are using physically based climate processes in order to make the predictions, also giving us more confidence that they may learn these patterns in observations when we sort of throw them as an out of sample response. And basically the take home message from this, this study was we found that the contribution from internal variability in the real world has been a significant contributor to why we're seeing less warming in the tropical troposphere than in climate models. Essentially, we're observing sort of an outlier realization of internal variability, but that there's also other things going on. So we found that comparing this one simulation with differences in aerosols like biomass burning, also really affected sort of climate model projections of tropos tropical tropospheric warming. Um, so you can use these types of machine learning methods, again, as another way, sort of an attribution type method. And that's sort of what is the finding from this work. So the last sort of example I want to go through, uh, um, hopefully have some time for questions, is another sort of using machine learning for climate scenarios. But I want us to return to the surface and no longer think in the vertical. So here's just a map of recent temperature trends. And, you know, one of the things that climate scientists are concerned about is sort of keeping an idea of how much global warming there has been sort of since pre-industrial levels. Um, so we are essentially, you know, as of 2022, nearing sort of the 1.2 degrees Celsius above the 1850 to 1900 baseline. And there's been a lot of work to look at climate risk, um, especially through things like the Paris Climate Accord, to approach, you know, what are the, the risks from climate change for things approaching like 1.5 or 2 degrees Celsius. So there's been some work uh, to think about, you know, what would happen if for sort of climate intervention type methods. I, I want to say that I'm not here advocating for any of these types of methods at all. Um, but what sort of I'm looking at here is trying to understand if these methods were ever considered seriously, sort of do we even understand how the climate system would respond? So one of these climate intervention or geoengineering methods is this idea that you can release stratospheric aerosols sort of into the atmosphere, which sort of reflects shortwave radiation acting as sort of a cooling mechanism or maintaining Earth's temperature. So it's sort of, you know, the question we're asking here is, let's say some actor all of a sudden started doing stratospheric aerosol injection, would we be able to detect whether that was ongoing? So you might say, for those of you who work in sort of remote sensing, well, of course, you know, we could look at aerosol optical depth and, you know, know whether there was some all of a sudden this anomaly of aerosols. But the question we're asking in this work is whether we could detect an influence on climate patterns. So that's what we're going to sort of use for machine learning. So I'll return to an example of temperature. One of these maps is from a world that's undergoing future climate change. One of these maps is undergoing climate intervention. And if I were to ask you by looking at these maps, which one is undergoing climate intervention, would you be able to know? OK, what if I gave you a map of precipitation, you know, where there's more extremes? Would you be able to determine which map is coming from one of these SAI worlds? So you might say, OK, well, that's really silly. You know, we have lots of methods in climate science to sort of look at things like temperature trends and anomalies. Why are you just looking at raw data? So let's now look at anomalies. Let's look at the top rows, temperature anomalies, the bottom rows, precipitation anomalies. Would you be able to know which which column is coming from a world that's undergoing stratospheric aerosol injection? So the correct answer is the one, the row on the left. And you might say, well, you know, there's a bit more blue in the upper left than the one on the right. So maybe we could have determined that that was the world that's a bit cooler. But if you actually look at different ensemble members from these simulations, there's tons of internal variability. It's pretty difficult to distinguish uh, sort of which one's warmer versus cooler. And again, just returning to the first set of maps. So what does this sort of global mean look like? You know, do we even need advanced statistical methods to be able to determine whether there is effects on weather and climate? So what you're looking at here is sort of the global mean surface temperature for, um, looking forward into the mid 21st century, where the blue one is the climate change world. And then the red one is that is the world with stratospheric aerosol injection. 
So you'll notice that in general, for most regions, you know, the red one is below the blue one. But I really want to point out the overlap between the simulations. So that's where you see there's sort of the blue shaded overlap with the red shaded overlap, which is really common essentially in all regions, especially for the first first decade. And that's showing sort of the effect of internal climate variability. So could we use, you know, a statistical method to be able to know, you know, be able to dis still distinguish the two simulations, even though climate variability is having such a big effect? And then if you ask, you know, not for temperature, but for something like precipitation, so you're here looking at, you're looking at the means for, again, the different same regions, you can see that they overlap in all the regions, even for really small regions like over the Amazon. So essentially using these types of really simple methods, you would not be able to detect, you know, whether there was an influence of stratospheric aerosol injections just by taking regional means. So let's set up some super simple machine learning methods to be able to know, could we distinguish? Um, so what I'm using here is logistic regression uh, for this, and I'm essentially asking sort of a binary classification problem. And we're training on a set of new climate model large ensemble simulations um, where one of the sets of simulations is undergoing sort of a moderate emissions scenario of climate change. That's the S. I'm using interest for right. Tibetan individuals. That's, you don't use so good meeting, man. That's OK. <laughs> That's SSP245. And then another set of maps coming from the stratospheric aerosol injection. So how to read these sort of diagrams I've come up with is that the top row, so the top sets of dots, the top row, it's if it's a red dot, that means it's predicting that it's coming from SSP245. It means it's getting it right. And then for the bottom row of the, the temperature pair, um, if it's blue, that's coming from the stratospheric aerosol injection. So the top one is temperature set. The bottom set is for precipitation. So you might say, well, sort of, you know, what does the mean state look like? So essentially what we've seen here is that aerosol injection essentially starts in 2035 in these simulations. And for the first decade, um, you know, there are, it, it's getting the prediction in some cases correct, but there's clearly differences. Um, so sort of here's what the simulations look like. Um, this is your, just you're looking at your mean state. And I've shown just the predictions from global, uh, from the logistic regression, but we're really interested here in regional maps. So we're gonna sort of produce those types of predictions for many different regions. And that's sort of what's outlined here. And I just want to show sort of, again, what the data looks like. So what you're looking at here is temperature trends. This is the ensemble mean, but I, I really want to highlight, um, you know, just how much variability is in these simulations where there's only sort of a moderate forcing. So you're looking at the top row is for sort of the early period of this, this set of simulations. And then the bottom row is sort of a later period. So you can see sort of you know, there is cooling in general for the SAI column, but not all regions are, and that's due to the climate variability. But in the SSP245, most regions are warming. Then you can sort of take the difference of two and again, find that there's, even in the ensemble mean, there's quite a bit of spatial variability. I can do this again for precipitation. I won't spend too much time on it and just find that again, lots of variability. So, Let's return to the questions of how we use the machine learning. So I've already introduced the logistic regression problem, but I also want to, you to think about this uh, from a different perspective. So let's say we, we know that the uh, first method can determine whether we are experiencing climate intervention. Can we ask a neural network to tell us, okay, if we are experiencing climate intervention, would we know when it first started? So how many years it has been since the injection? Again, we're gonna be inputting maps of temperature and precipitation. And then in this last method, it's sort of a regression problem. And I'll just show some of the results for the logistic regression. So this is the, the binary classification problem. Top row here, this is for temperature where a red dot in the top is right. Uh, the blue dot, if it's on the bottom, that means it's that means it's correct. So you can see essentially by 2044, you're getting perfect predictions. In other words, the logistic regression model is able to determine with perfect accuracy after less than a decade whether or not we are experiencing one of these worlds. 
So you might say, well, the global mean is, is, is simple. What about for regions? So now I'm taking a look at some different regions, areas that have high climate variability, like in the Arctic and Antarctic. You can see, surprisingly, at least it was surprising to me, given how much internal climate variability is in these simulations, that the logistic regression model was doing pretty well. Look at the Arctic. It's essentially for SSP245 getting a nearly perfect prediction for almost all years going from the initial injection point in 2035 all the way until 2070. There's interestingly more variability or more incorrect predictions for the Antarctic. And then another, to me, surprising prediction was in the tropics. And I guess rethinking about this is that since there's less sort of noise uh, variability in the tropics that the logistic regression model, I think, is able to sort of learn sort of the forced responses better in that area. So you're getting a really great prediction skill um, by just inputting maps of tropical temperatures. Um, and here is just some other smaller regions. Uh, I won't spend too much time here, but essentially getting at the idea is that even if you get into smaller domains, that the these statistical techniques are still able to learn patterns in the data. So like everything I've shown so far, we can then use explainability methods to try to figure out how it's making its correct predictions. So what you're looking at here is just sort of a simple method for logistic regression by just taking sort of the weights of the logistic regression model times each input map. So here, sort of red areas on the left are for temperature, which which were more important regions uh, for the logistic regression model to make its predictions for global maps. And then on the uh, right hand side, it's the same thing for precipitation. We can then sort of compare these, these explainability maps to sort of other types of climate science techniques that we know, like signal to noise maps, where essentially anything greater than one indicates that that's a forced response. Those are the two, two right maps. This is for temperature. So essentially you can compare the maps on the right of signal to noise with the explainability maps. And what you can sort of determine is that the logistic regression model is using patterns of force change to make its prediction. We can sort of repeat the same exercise for precipitation starting globally. It does pretty well. Correct predictions for SSP245 are the green dots on the top, and then orange brown dots are correct for stratospheric aerosol injection on the bottom. But I just want to show one more result um, for that neural network where we sort of ask the regression problem. Um, you know, how many years has it been since injection? And this is again sort of almost the same type of question as I asked before about you know predicting the year. This is sort of the inverse of it. So perfect predictions would be paralleling the white one to one line. So what you're essentially seeing here is there's a, a lot of variability in these predictions, um, but you can see that there is an upward trend, meaning that the neural network is somehow learning patterns that it's you know patterns that evolve through time even though it's not given explicitly temporal information to be able to know forced climate change due to the climate intervention so i hope that all of this work has sort of demonstrated that we can ask really simple and sometimes silly questions uh, using machine learning methods and then apply explainability methods to learn new science and sort of compare them to existing methods that we already know and sort of my takeaway from this work is not just the, the examples I've shown you, but more broadly is that to me, machine learning is just another tool I use. I, you know, I don't think of myself as that I have to use machine learning or that it's the best tool for all applications, but it's just another method that we can use to better understand the Earth system. Machine learning is definitely no longer a black box. As I've shown, there's these explainability methods and then a whole field of something called interpretability to really try to understand what's going on. And that I think we can actually learn some new science, really even using these types of simple applications. So I think I will end here. And if you're more interested in this work, uh, the examples I've shown, those are the papers there. So thank you. Zach, that was that was really cool. I really enjoyed that. Thank you. I, I think these simple questions, uh, I mean, basically removing something that you know must be related. I just think it's so fun to just take the year out and make it predict that. <laughs> so instead of, in, I, mean, I don't know if someone asked the question, but I have one immediately. So uh, is, is your intuition that it's good to pick a relationship where you just know it should be obviously related? I mean, like, how do you get the idea to remove the year? Because I get the trend here is like, okay, I, I 
Obviously, the year's got to be related, so I'll remove that, and then I'll look at when it's not related, and then there's got to be something wrong with the model. Is that kind of what's going on? Yeah, that's the app. That's sort of the idea. So the tricky part of with these questions, is you have to pick something where you know telling temporally what year it is has the climate system doesn't affect you know time. Um, so, but clearly that climate is related to you know how the system evolves through time. So you have to pick sort of a variable that isn't intrinsically related in the system where you can ask these questions, and you also have to. You know, pick a variable you, that you kind of know what the answer is. So, what I mean by that is, we know what year it is in observations, and we know what year it is in climate models. Um, so, we can sort of apply those different types of data sets because we know the answer. But in many cases, we don't always know the perfect answer, particularly in the real world. So, it can be tricky. Like in the second example, we don't know for sure what the internal external components are in observations. We do in the large ensembles, but we don't in observations. So, you have to be, in my opinion, careful with these simple questions about do we actually know the answer when you apply out of sample data sets? I have a question online. Uh, can I see a hand? Someone online unmute yourself. Before. Uh, Mohammed, go ahead. Uh, Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Perfect. Yes. Uh, so my question is: Let's say if someone was uh, running a company, uh, what what would you suggest for them? Say say it was to do with uh, maybe artificial intelligence or computing that sort of field. Uh, how how what would you suggest for them to make it more sustainable? Uh, so, yeah, that's basically my question. Yeah, um, <laughs> my answer to that is keep it simple. I truly think through a lot of trial and error in our research group that simple machine learning methods have been we have found just as good or better for many types of different applications. You know, going back, do you really need a nonlinear neural network or can you use something like logistic regression? Um, you know, do you need the flashiest computer science method that just appeared on archive or can you use, you know, a simple neural network? Um, I, I really think keeping it simple, not only have we found that it's useful for climate applications, but we've also found it useful for things like seasonal to decadal prediction, but it also works. It's easier than to use explainability methods on less complex machine learning methods. So that would be my suggestion. Great, Jiafeng, do you want to go ahead? Thank you. Jiafeng? I think uh, you might have uh, frozen. Uh, yeah. Can you hear me? Sorry. Yeah, perfect. Go ahead. Oh yeah, so I have a question. So for the last few slides, you say the prediction accuracy, they are like uh, really high, they are all green. But because we we can't really see the future, do you like how, how do you, how did you define like the accuracy things? I'm just curious. You know, that's a great point. So it's accurate for that climate model simulation. Um, so you know, for this field, I'm not really in the field of climate intervention, but there is a growing field and there's more and more of these climate model simulations being developed and to be honest this is one of the only ones so it's it's accurate in a world simulated by that climate model this is csm2 wacom 6 if anyone's interested so as more of these types of climate intervention versus climate change scenarios get developed i think it would be interesting to see sort of how out of sample realizations of the possible future might how they might score in these types of methods. And I have no answer on how well it would do or not. <laughs> OK, yes, uh, thank you very much. And also another quick one is like uh, you say for some of the model is only accurate for some region, but would you try to change the model for the region that they didn't predict uh, accurate? Yes, uh, so in some of the work I didn't show today, uh, we we sort of looked at regions in different climate models and who does better. Uh, so yes, so in some cases we do find that some climate models as unsurprisingly are better for different regions. So yeah, that that is definitely an important factor here. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. We have Tristan, go ahead. Yeah, uh, 
just a question, sort of climatology question, I guess. I know nothing about climatology. But uh, in the sort of part one of your talk, that North Atlantic part seems to be very important. And to what extent is that telling you that the North Atlantic, the sort of spatial distribution of temperature anomaly is, an, is a good climate predictor globally versus reanalysis data and model data coincided well in that region historically? Yes, that is a really important question. And I think it is a bit of a caveat to answer that for these explainability methods. So these explainability methods can tell you where the neural network, for instance, looked, but it cannot tell you sort of the why part of it. So why did it look there or how did it sort of spatially leverage the points together? It doesn't tell you that. So I mentioned this interpretability field and th that sort of field of interpretable uh, machine learning gets more at the question of why. However, you know, you may say, well, why didn't you do that a method? It's because it's a lot more difficult um, sort of to sort of create neural networks that are interpretable to really get at the question you asked, you know, can, is this an important predictor? So really the explainability methods are useful, but there are caveats along with them on how much we can really say then uh, for thinking like in the physical climate space. Yeah, go ahead. So carrying on from the first example you gave, the North Atlantic, so we know, I guess, at least according to models, when we run them just with aerosols, the AMOC, so Atlantic motion circulation speeds up, whereas just greenhouse gases, it slows down. So is that something to do with the, the results that you're seeing and why the Atlantic is important? And also, does it, the fact that the aerosol train model didn't do that well, is that suggesting that the models are responding too much to aerosols, but I'm not in the right way. Can we say anything like that? Yeah, th that is actually a question I've been thinking a lot about my latest work that I've been doing recently about how climate models might be a bit too sensitive to aerosol forcing and how can we use the machine learning questions sort of to get at that from a different perspective. So I, I think um, my interpretation of at least of the first project's results is exactly that, is that what we're seeing is an, sort of an example of where climate models might be a bit too sensitive to aerosol forcing than what we see in observations. And But to think about that question a bit more is sort of where my, my recent research has been developed. So hopefully, <laughs> maybe next year I'll have more to share on that. I didn't completely understand how you get the relevance map. So you have a fully connected neural network and I have a spatial input, but then you have just a uh, yeah, simple uh, fully connected. So you, do you reshape the weights in an image and you plot them or, or it was something to do with back propagation? I, yeah, if you could just explain it again. Sure, yeah, I didn't really get into the details. I apologize for that. Um, so essentially what you do is, you know, you train your neural network, and then at that point, you sort of lock sort of the weights and the bias, and then you sort of back propagate the prediction through the network. So it preserves the shape of the original image, uh, and there is a sets of all of these different back propagation rules. So layer-wise relevance propagation is kind of a broad name for this explainability method. And then you can take these different mathematical rules on how it propagates backwards uh, through the network to create the heat map. Um, and then you can compare the different methods. So we did that in some of the work. Um, but anyway, that's essentially what it's doing. So it may, as you're propagating backward, it keeps the same input shape. And then you can just make the heat map um, from that. Eventually, what you're visualizing is the gradient of the output mathematically. What, what would exactly, be? exactly, yes. Yeah, in, in some of our recent work, instead of doing like the layerwise relevance back propagation rules, we actually just sort of did an inputs times gradient uh, heat map and found that, that something simple like that is actually quite similar to LRP. I think there's, there's even a website, right, with the people that made LRP call. Is it called heatmap? Or heat mapping, or something like that. It's yeah, it's, it, yeah, it's really useful to compare across the rules. Yeah. It's a great website to get started on these techniques, I think. And talking to Zach as well. 
Um, so I, mean, I guess we should we should wrap up there. I I guess um, because Zach isn't here physically, it's a little bit harder for everyone to meet with him than coffee. But Zach has the little uh, thing in his email. I have also circulated where basically you can you can just organize a time to chat. I know Zach is would be very keen to talk to anyone who wants to know more about this stuff uh, and, and possibly work together as well. Um, yeah, and I just want to say thanks again, Zach. This was this was really great. So thank you for coming along. And, um, and thanks for everyone coming here. Uh, this community is something that's just over a year old, and I'm just really happy that this worked out so well. And thanks everyone for coming. We meet every month on the first Friday of the month, and we will have more seminars like this coming up. So sign up. So thank you very much. Yeah, thanks. Bye. Yeah, thank you, everyone. And yeah, I'm happy to meet with anyone at any time. Yeah, and uh, thank you.